Welcome and good evening friends and colleagues to yet another lecture on the CSMBS online platform. We hope you're all safe and are enjoying our talks and lectures. We also hope you will register for all our wonderful events in December. It's going to be quite an active month. Our newsletter for December will be out shortly, which announces several talks all through the month. Well, today we have a very special speaker for you, someone who has spoken last year as well, and he was so popular that we thought we should invite him again to share his thoughts. Professor Ranabir Chakrabarti is a retired professor of ancient history from the Center for Historical Studies at the JNU New Delhi. He specializes in social and economic history of early India with a particular interest in the Indian Ocean maritime history. A regular contributor to refereed journals and edited academic volumes, Professor Chakravarti has authored, co-authored and edited several publications, including a source book of Indian civilization, trade in early India, trade and traders in early Indian society, Indo-Judaic studies in the 21st century, a view from the margin, exploring early India, history of Bangladesh, early Bengal in regional perspectives, up to, up to circa 1200 CE, and the pull towards the coast, the Indian Ocean history and the subcontinent prior to 1500 CE, to name a few. Professor Chakravarti is the recipient of several international fellowships from UK, USA and the Netherlands. He was elected the sectional president for ancient India of the Indian History Congress in its 72nd session in Patiala held in 2011. He also presided over the Ancient India section of Punjab History Congress and has recently been awarded the Hem Chandra Roy Chaudhary Centenary Gold Medal by the Asiatic Society of Calcutta. I now invite Professor Chakravarti to deliver the special lecture on maritime cities and coastal societies in South Asia. Quite a hot topic and I do hope you will enjoy this talk and ask a few questions in the end. I will assist Professor Chakravarti in articulating your questions so that he can answer them. Professor Chakravarti, up to you now. Very good evening to everyone. I am very deeply thankful to Dr. Sabhyasachi Mukherjee, Director General of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj uh, Vastu Shangrahalai, and the wonderful team which helped me to uh, prepare and now come before the audience. Uh, there, are, there is a wonderful team of madams, Boidehi, Renuka madam, Urbashi madam and Madam Jayati Roy and some of whom I had met before. I had the pleasure of meeting them before and when Dr. Mukherjee placed a request for speaking before an audience uh, and I could not even dream of saying no this is one of the best possible hosts you can find in this country and this institution has been a major platform of uh, bringing awareness to a very large number of people regarding the heritage of this country and its connectivity to a wider world. And what bet better place it can be than the city of Mumbai. And at the city of Mumbai, I chose of speaking on coastal societies and maritime cities. Uh, I My span is roughly about 700 years. And so from here, I would like to start. Uh, when we talk about the coastal uh, societies and maritime cities, the we are essentially looking at what is the peninsular part of India, because the greater parts of North India is a landlocked region, except for two openings to the flank on its west and the east, that is the Gujarat seaboard and the Bengal seaboard, which is also a very large delta. And this is a landlocked area. So moment we talk of the coast, 
we have to go what is called Deccan and the far south, and thereby we are trying to bring into historical focus peninsular part of India and less on the landlocked region, though the coast, the coastal society and maritime cities, which often dot the coast, are linked up directly or sometimes indirectly with the interior. And the coastal area, when we talk of this uh, coastal areas, uh, there is uh, the, the coastal segments on the two flanks of the subcontinent give it a very distinctive shape the two long coastlines jut out into the Indian Ocean, the only enclosed ocean in the world, the third largest ocean in the world. And this jutting out gives the geographical centrality of the subcontinent, the South Asian subcontinent, along with the island of Sri Lanka, at the very center of the Indian Ocean which was traversed for very, very long time, at least over the last four millennia or 4,500 years before the present times, largely because of the use of the predictable alterations of the monsoon wind and by using the ubiquitous plank, wooden plank ships, which were tied by coconut coir and the best possible material, the good quality timber and coconut coir abound as floral resources, both the coastal areas. So this is immediately takes us to the Bay of Bengal area. We shall come very soon to the uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, the network of these coastal areas. And now the two seaboards give a very peculiar shape and this distinctiveness. And this distinctiveness is no less significant or captivating than the very vast agrarian tracts uh, fed by many life-giving strings of major rivers and populated by a vast multitude of agriculturists and craftsmen. So now into the coastal area, the triangular shape. As I said, the subcontinent was at the very center of a very long history of traversing this maritime space. Yet the presentation of the map say the map of Eratosthenes, a Greek geographer of the third century BC, a more or less a contemporary of, an elder contemporary of Ashoka. You will find that the Indian land mass is not at all portrayed as a triangular shape, but a quadrilateral. And a, a quadrilateral with the island of Sri Lanka shown as a, a at, at, at the eastern part. Similarly, this quadrilateral feature continues in the famous maps of Ptolemy. The original map is lost and now only available in print. But interestingly, prints began to be made available and copies from uh, mid of the 15th century. And this is a uh, copy of the Ptolemy's map of India. And you can very well see that the coastline, say from the present delta of the Indus, which stands as 21 degree north latitude to the tip of the peninsula, that is Kanyakumari, where the two coasts meet, is located at 7 degrees latitude north. So there is a 14 degree latitude gap, which in Ptolemy's map actually is reduced to only 4 degrees. That's why, once again, the typical flat, a quadrilateral shape of the peninsula. This is largely because of the understanding of the coast, but the problems of cartographic presentations of the coast. And that's why the coast doesn't appear 
even in a world map in the recently discovered book of curiosities this is an arabic text with maps originally prepared in 11th century in egypt but the present copy a faithful good quality copy of it belongs to about 200 years later and this is a map in which on the left hand side you can see a, a uh, long uh, once again a quadrilateral shape and this is the indian ocean and i'll give you a de a little bit more de this is the indian ocean once again looking like a quadrilateral and the coast is never visible uh, this is once again in the book of curiosities the original map is in the collection of the bodleian museum in oxford university england it is only in the from the first half of the 16th century and then onwards that the cartographical representation of the coastline of india the triangular shape began to be made and available in the european maps more and more improved because these were done on cartographic principle but the earlier description even in visual terms of the landmass and the coast and the sea was done essentially on the basis of thalassography not actually on thalassology and with the available sea charts made by north atlantic people uh, political powers merchant companies particularly the east india companies from england from holland and also from france began to portray more carefully and locate the coasts and the coastal configuration with the presence of the ports the sea charts but these were done essentially with the with an aspiration to dominate the indian ocean by north atlantic people so the better thalassology is intimately associated with thalassocratic uh, aspirations which later uh, took the full bloom from the uh, mid 18th century i'm not getting into that the interesting point is where to look for the maritime cities and the coastal societies the coastal society will of course be close to the coast and then the maritime cities will often take the shape of ports but not each and every port can be considered a maritime cities the coastal society and maritime cities can be linked together can be placed together for the present purpose because they they appear to be distinct from the society in the mainland the interior society the continental society in that sense that here are the people who are connected with their life and livelihood on the sea even if they do not reside exactly on the shore of the sea and this is the area where you find the inhabitants are sailors shippers various types of crew who are called the navikas in sanskrit texts and al askar in arabic that from where the term laskar is better known to us the fisher folk the sometimes the pearl divers and the merchants from different areas and ship owning merchants along with that the pirates the boat manufacturers and interestingly the this is a scene in 1662 of the port area near kullam or quilon of present day in malabar and you don't see here a harbor structure with which nowadays we can easily identify a maritime city like mumbai like chennai like kochi because no harbor structure is seen on the coastal areas for the uh, berthing of the ships and actually you can find many 
the ships were in the in 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 the deeper sea area and were connected with smaller dinghy like vessels which are abound in this area and hardly the harbor structures were required because actually none of the pre modern ports were exactly located like present in mumbai or chennai directly on the sea facing the sea these were often located slightly inland in either the estuaries or the backwaters of kerala or the inlets and creeks which abound particularly in the konkan coast like the thana creek like the basin creek and slightly sheltered and the broken nature of the entire west coast abound in this kind of creeks uh, inlets backwaters in sharp contrast to the eastern seaboard where we find a number of river deltas deltas on the west coast only number 2 one at the indus delta and other at the narmada delta while right from the southernmost tip of the east coast like the vaigai and tamraparni delta you go along the east coast northwards and reach to the northernmost part of the bay of bengal which is the largest bay in the world you also meet there the largest delta in the world the bengal delta the ganga delta and in between these two there are large deltas not as large as the ganga delta and deltas are the typical features of the eastern seaboard these two and it is in the deltas that you find the advent of the ports of different uh, of graded importance and what happens there take for example this is the close to the coastal site of alagankulam a very well known uh, tamil nadu coastal and maritime site of the early historic times slightly earlier than the period we are covering but it shows where the river vaigai meets the bay of bengal and it is at the slightly sheltered and inland the maritime site a port site of alagankulam was situated in tamil nadu and le- let us look at this as i say this is bimlipatnam to the north of present day visakhapatnam in andhra pradesh bimlipatnam was a precursor to visakhapatnam of the colonia of the uh, early modern times and here you can see in the foreground a fishing vessel in the background two larger modern day trawlers are under construction there is no shipyard there is no harbor to build the ships they are just on the beach and the smaller dinghies and the larger vessels are brought ashore you do not require a harbor or a dockyard to manufacture to repair to uh, reassemble the vessels and this is the interesting part of the making of the coastal society and the and 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 the boat manufacturers live and work in close proximity to the fisher folk whose vessels are can be clearly seen here I'll now take you to a quick survey of the coastal societies along the both the coasts and try to situate some of the premier maritime cities in this area. Interestingly, if we look at the famous navigational manual of Ahmad ibn Majid, the greatest muallim or navigator. in the indian ocean prior to the advent of the portuguese in the at the turn of the 16th century al hind that is the subcontinent south asian subcontinent had four major uh, uh, coastal segments in the west coast starting from the area of present day uh, the gulf of dwaraka area from there to uh, damao daman via kanvaya or kambe this is 
Jazurat, the coastal area of Gujarat, followed by that of Kunkan or Kunkan, that is Konkan, from Sanjan down to almost Goa, from Goa, then for the southwards, Tuluwan, that is the Tulu coast, up to almost touching Mangalore, almost the Karnatic, southernmost part of present day Karnatic coast. Karnata coast, not South Kannada coast. And then beneath that, the famous Muneibar, Muleibar, that is Malabar of the of present Kerala. On the east coast, there Ahmad ibn Majid speaks of the Bar al Shulian, the coast of the Shulian, that is a Cholas, exactly the, the Arab base of the later English. Uh, uh, English uh, toponym Coromandel, and then Bar al Nut, that is the Andhra coast, then comes farther to the north, Varasi, that is the Orissa coast, and Orissa coast and the Andhra coast, the southernmost parts of Orissa and the northern part of Andhra Pradesh coast almost blend together. And then at the northernmost tip of the Orissa coast, is Al Banj that is starts the Bengal coast, which also is an admixture of the vast Ganga Brahmaputra Delta spreading from West Midnapur district of West Bengal right up to Chattagram in present day Bangladesh. And here I would I should have started with Gujarat, but I'll take it up at the very last. Let me start the journey of the coastal society and the maritime societies thereof maritime cities uh, from Konkan. But before I do that, let me see why I use the word maritime cities. This is a term, an expression. I'm inspired by the use of it by Ashindas Gupta, who used it to understand in his own masterly fashion the port city of Surat on the river Tapi, the greatest port of the Mughal India. Maritime cities, this appellation to me serves better than the more commonly used terms like port cities, city with a port, the, uh, the port towns or port of trade, because by that one often takes the position that it is invariably on the sea coast, as I said, Many of the famous ports, including Sasurat, including Bharuj, including even present day Kolkata, Calcutta, Masulipatnam, were not exactly located on the coastal area. They were slightly inland. Therefore, the Tar Maritime City used, used by Ashindas Gupta in his study of Surat tells us this is a city which has a port but which is deeply connected with the sea. Its entire life is embedded with and oriented towards the sea, though it may not lie exactly on the shore. And the maritime city is open to varied cultural and social norms and more open than a city in the interior. When we talk also of the city, I shall use the criteria used by Professor B. D. Chattopadhyay in understanding urbanization and urban centers in, in uh, early medieval times, where he says that there should be the prime consideration of the city-ness, because the city, an important city, will have a clearly demarcated, differentiated organization of the space meant for diverse functions the city was meant to perform. Mere trade and mere unloading, loading facilities will not give a coastal side the character of a city. Greater the differentiated functions of the site near the coast or slightly inland will give 
rise to the cityness of the city and therefore the greater the diversity of the functions at the site more pronounced will be the differentiated or space the organization of the differentiated space of that site and therefore its linkages with the sea its orientation to the sea will give the appellation of maritime cities that's why maritime cities are often ports but not all ports will come to the category of maritime cities now here i'm beginning with the image of the famous ajanta ships and though ajanta is inland it obviously has a bearing upon the konkan coast and similarly the konkan coast is according to jean delage the best possible coastal segment in india for the natural formation of ports because of a number of inlets and creeks as i just mentioned and this is a typical feature of a double masted uh, ship from aurangabad in maharashtra once again not exactly on the coast but slightly inland i'll come back to this later and here we can see the very famous island of elephanta of mumbai and now once again i'll come back to it slightly later it has been described as the lakshmi of the western indian ocean aparajalati now the coast and the interior how one gets into slightly inland areas the particularly there is a sajyadri range in the konkan coast the access from the coast to the interior is provided by this kind of a pass and here it is nanaghat pass historically known from the days of the satavahanas and it is still in use as we find people are uh, people are using this pass from to reach the coast and then into junnar near pune and because of this accessibility the silahar rulers a typical coastal polity from the 10th century to about early 12th and even slightly later established toll taking jars in order to collect tolls and customs obviously for trading purposes the the konkan area in this coastal zone which is well known as kumkam kamkam ma kamkam even in arabic sources it extends up to goa and we can see only in this area very peculiar hero stones showing now this is a sculpture available in the goa museum archaeological museum at goa where you can easily see not only a large sea going vessel with oars and also a rudder at the stern post rudder but also a scene of some kind of a coastal war a viragal or a hero stone where a person is being pierced this is an inscribed goa viragal stone the inscription is yet to be read and similar such scenes of naval skirmishes you can see a person in the foreground with a bow and with uh, multiple oared vessels these are unique kinds of vessels sh showing skirmishes close to the coast typical of a coastal political authority in the konkan area i'll come back to this very soon and another possibly a politically important person with a parasol on his head at the front of the deck of another vessel now in the konkan area as i said this is an area known for its timber a number of ports and there also a a number of professional groups let us look at the city of sopara nalla sopara present day is known as suparaga shudparaka 
in this area. The 7th century Sanskrit Jataka stories called Jataka Malavarya Shura describes the port of Shudparaka as being a place where at least metaphorically the Buddha is an expert mariner. The Buddhist network is very clear from the Suparaka Jataka, which is in Sanskrit, the Shudparaka Jataka, because the Buddha is adept in crossing the sea, taking the ship in and out of the creeks from the port, and that Aharana Aparana. And at this Suparaka, port of Suparaka, Supara, the story of a particular Jaina text, Kubalayamala, speaks of the ardent wish of the son of a merchant on a sea voyage. The father repeatedly asks his son not to take this dangerous voyage full of uncertainties of an unknown land at a distant place. But the son is adamant and actually starts the journey. Now, there is a graphic description of how the ship is fitted out at the port city of Sopara, where merchants have come and where merrymaking, songs, and bands are almost being played out before the journey starts. This is the typical scene in a maritime city where there is a Buddhist element very clearly there. This port figures very prominently, slightly later Arabic text as Subara, with the possibilities of Muslim merchants being accommodated there in the coastal side. And also, the Joyna stories are also well acquainted with this particular port town. And here, as the, uh, as the Joyna tale of Kuvalayamala narrates us, there is a chatting of different merchants in a leisurely manner, Bonik Meli, not kind of a guild like organization, but merchants are relaxing after their journeys and telling each other, sometimes boastfully, of their achievements, their experiences, sometimes tales of the land they have visited. This is once again a typical feature of the meeting grounds of diverse people from the from different areas and speaking in different languages. Similarly, slightly north of the area of uh, present day Sopara and Sopara, as we know, is known to be the site of an Oshokan set of rock edicts. So its port-like character, the coastal character, is already attested right from 3rd century BCE. To the north of Sopara, almost at the very northern edge of the northern edge of uh, Konkan, one comes across the city of Sanjan. Now at Sanjan, it is definitely seen as a Velakula, a port, but it's also an administrative division under the Silahara rulers, where, interestingly, we have names of Muslim Arabic merchants whose names have been Sanskritized, and one of them is serving as a local administrator under the Rashtrakuta rulers, who are the overlords of this area. Similarly, we find in the city of Sanjan, close to the city of Sanjan, two Brahmanical shrines, one a Devi Durga shrine and another a Vaishnava shrine set up by Marchand from Bhinmal from Rajasthan, Billamala Madhusudana Deva. And close, slightly south of Mumbai at Saimur of the Arab text called Chaur, 20, 23 miles down of down south of present day Mumbai, we have the recordings of Al Masudi of early 10th century, who speaks of the settlement of Omani, Sirafi, Baghdadi, 
Muslim merchants along with Bayasira merchants. That is the, those Arab Muslim merchants who did not have great pedigree. And they are all having uh, their own Friday mosques. Very interestingly, another northern suburb of Mumbai, the area of present day Kanheri near Borivali, we have by early 11th century six inscriptions in a pronounced, pronounced Buddhist vihara and Buddhist uh, monuments, six donations made in Pahlavi inscriptions. Obviously, people using the Pahlavi language and script coming from Iran, and these are possibly the fair fire worshipping uh, communities, the Zoroastrian communities, who left their donations at the Buddhist site of Kaneri. It is no wonder, therefore, if we take into account this cluster, the the definite presence of fire worshipping uh, Zoroastrians in the recent excavations undertaken at the site of uh, at the site of uh, Sanjan, and this is very clearly brought out in a recent work of Rukshana Nanji in this area. If we go slightly south of Konkan Kos, we come across in inscriptions the presence of a Novitaka, a ship-owning merchant, a very distinct coastal community with three generations of his successors engaged in shipping business, coastal shipping business. They are all given the epithet of Srishti. But what is significant that this merchant Vasaidam as Novitaka is also a high-ranking functionary in the local coastal polity of the southern Silahara kingdom. This is very typical of a coastal polity where a merchant could assume some administrative responsibilities as Mahamatya, a very senior high-ranking officer in the coastal polity, and who possibly also was responsible for exemption of the ships of his of his family members from tolls and customs visiting South Konkan port, particularly the Kharepatan, which is called Bolipatan. And this tendency will be there also in, in the southernmost part of Konkan, also in Malabar, where from, we are now entering the region of Malabar, and this is the area of Kodugan, Kodungallur, to the north of the city of Cochin of present times. And this is Malabar area, where we find from the Jewish Geniza records of 12th century, how there were two Indic ship owners. One is called Fatan Sami, the other is Fadiyar. And interestingly, these are Arabicized names of what is called Pattanaswami and the Fadiyar. Both are local important persons in the Malabar society. Both were administrative functionaries. Pattanaswami is the is the kind of in charge of a Pattana or a port town, and he is figuring in the Geniza Jewish Geniza records as a ship owner. Similarly, Padiyar is also a ship owner. So. In the, on the other hand, in the case of Konkan, we saw how a ship owner was engaged in administrative function in a coastal society and polity. Here we find two administrators of high ranking positions in Malabar coastal society is investing in shipping business. This is one second typical feature of a coastal society. The other indelible mark of the coastal society is the presence of cultural plurality, the accommodation and promotion of cultural plurality. This is typically seen in the Mar Thoma Church in Kodungallur and the jetty on the typical uh, backwaters of Kerala. 
And that this Martoma charge figures in as early as 849 CE copper plate charter, the Kullam copper plate charter, where Sthanu Ravi, the local Kerala ruler, granted lands in favor of this Christian charge, which is recorded in Malayalam language and script. But there are signatories as witnesses at the end of the Malayalam land grant record. And this is very significant where we have signatures in Arabic Kufic script, Pehlavi script and Hebrew. So there were Arab Muslim merchants. There were similarly Pehlavi using mercantile communities, coastal communities in using Pehlavi and obviously Jewish merchants. And this will be once again seen when we also look at slightly later 1000 AD famous copper plate charter in favor of Joseph Rabban, the head of the Jewish community. And here we find the present day chairman mosque uh, said to have been the oldest mosque in India, definitely in Kerala. Uh, at least the tradition goes about 8th century, which has been described wonderfully by uh, Professor Keshavan Veluthat on the basis of Kerala Putti. It's possibly the recent readings by uh, Sebastian Prange would suggest that the, the mosque could have been built slightly later, around the 12th century, but the tradition may go to an earlier time. What is we find there in the coastal society, in the local host society of the Malayalam speaking Kerala society, the accommodation, the coexistence and promotion of pluralities of Islam, of Judaism and also of Christianity. And, and this is the coastal society known for its very major connectivities with both the area sectors of the Indian Ocean, both with the Western Indian Ocean, with the Persian Gulf area, with the Red Sea area, and also with Southeast Asia. And this is the present day uh, Jewish synagogue and the accompanying wall inscription, referring the Kochangardi, the Angardi at Kochi, dated 1344. And this is the Sib and the Jewish uh, city, Jewish sector in present day Kochi area. With this, I would turn into the East Coast area. The East Coast, uh, we have already seen the coastal areas of the Tamraparni Vaigai uh, Deltaic area noted right from the days of the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea and Ptolemy's geography, right up to the description of this coastal area in Marco Polo as ideal for the pearl fisheries and the use of the pearl divers who are also members of the coastal society. Please note that these people will normally be considered at the lower rung of the Varnajati society. But these people, like the merchants, like the shippers, the Nakhudas, the Novitakas, the ship captains, the crews, they're repeatedly taking to the sea, crossing the sea, barely taking into account the strictures in Brahmanical Sanskrit law books against the taking, against taking to the sea. There is hardly any indication of any expiation or penances done by taking to the sea, which is tabooed, there is no prashchitta. In fact, I should have said earlier when we talk about the Goa area, we have inscriptions from the Goa Kadamba rulers who take credit of taking to the Sri sea, crossing the sea in their own ships, Ambhanidhi Paraga in order to reach the famous sacred Shaiva site of Someshara, that is Somnath, which stands very close 
to the confluence of the river with the sea. We shall come back to the city later, the city of Somnath. But this is how, and look, none of the rulers of Goa Kadamburla ever talks of performing a penance or an expiation prashtitta by taking to the sea. They are in fact doing that in order to reach a very famous Shoiva sacred center. So the, it is not merely the Buddhist and the Jaina tales that acquaint us with the sea, the sea people, the boatmen, the march and the seafarers, but the Brahmanical religious life and visiting Brahmanical famous sacred centers also involves crossing the sea. Now we are talking of the typical Koromandal coastal area, the very famous port of Kaveri Pattinam, Kaveri Pumpattinam, Pum Puhar. This is the site of Puhar excavated. Uh, and here we find the remains, as the excavators found out, the remains of possibly a jetty. What we are grateful to Professor B.D. Chattopadhyay's remarkable analysis of the two very famous Tamil epics of the 6th century, primarily the, uh, the Silapadikaram and also to some extent the Manimekalai. The, the life at this maritime city in the delta of the river Kaveri. Here we find, according to the descriptions, that there were literary descriptions, two parts of the city. It is not merely a port, it's a city. There is an eastern part separated from the western part, the eastern part obviously very close to the sea, but not exactly on the sea. And here, the Maruvarupakkam, where are the typical buildings, according to the Tamil epic, the warehouses, the fishermen's, the fisher folks' residence and their working place, the area of the shippers, sailors, also of the jewelry makers, including diamond makers, along with the residence of non-local marches possibly coming from elsewhere across the seas. Also, the residents and activities of the Yavanas who are accommodated within the diverse population of the city. After and from the eastern part of the city, then comes a patch of gardens and orchards where in the daytime, Nalangadi mar daytime markets are active. In the evenings, it is Alangadi. The evening after dusk, business activities are carried on in the space between the eastern and the western sectors of the city. This is a kind of a gardens and orchards, which is the meeting ground of different kinds of wares, including the fishermen bring their catches for the city people to uh, to collect the delicacies of the the fish typical dietary culture of the coastal people on the western sector of the city which is pattinapakkam we find the habitat the habitational area earmarked of the more elite sections of the people rich merchants, the moneyed people, also some high-ranking administrative officers, also astrologers. So there is a clear division of the functional aspects of the city, one closer to the water body and the other slightly away from it, but the entire city area is a maritime city because it is deeply oriented towards the sea.
and this is indicated by the availability of the remains of a jetty. Also, there are remains of warehouses and wharfs, making it a typical maritime city. And this city, as we know from the contents of the Manimekalai and the and the Silapadikaram, are steeped in shramanic culture, Buddhist and Jaina. And this is also uh, recently excavated by the uh, by the Buddhist structure close to the site, uh, which has been recently unearthed. And this is the Kaveri Pattinam structures revealed underwater. To the slightly north, what is called the Vengi coastal area, dominated by the deltas of the rivers Godavari and Krishna. And here the Pallavas, like their Predecessors in this course, the Satavanas are also showing seagoing vessels on their coins. And once again, the orientation of the Pallavas, whose uh, area is essentially in slightly northern sector of Tamil Nadu, that is the Tondai Mandalam area of Tamil Nadu, touching the southern areas of Andhra coast, and the double masted ships can be seen on their coinage. In around 850 AD, in this area, we find in an inscription the a mention of a port called Sri Pallava Prithvi Pallava Pattanam. The very use of the word Pattanam makes it that it is a port area close to the coast. We do not know exactly where it was located. The inscription was deciphered and edited by the late. Uh, K.V. Ramesh, in recent times, it has been meticulously studied and analyzed by Shuchandra Ghosh and Shabodni Pramanik Naik, which shows, we do not know exactly where it is. It's an inscription related to the eastern Chalukya rulers of this Vengi area, who were in power right from 640-42 right up to 1070. It appears that the what is called Prithivi Pallava Pattanam actually means Sri Prithivi Pallava Pattanam, a Pattana or a coast with a prefix of the dynastic epithet of the Chalukya ruler Sri Prithivi Pallava. What is meant actually Sri Prithivi Pallava is pronounced and spelt as Sri, Prithivi, Sri Pallava. Sri Prithivi Pallava Pattan. The Pallavas had nothing to do with this coast. But what is very significant, as is brought out by Ghosh and Savadni Pramanik Naik, is the simultaneous presence of a number of Mahasarthavas, very eminent chief of the caravan traders. We have obviously come for trade into this coastal segment, and also combined with that, Maha. Now, because we have never come across an inscription seven to eight Mahanavikas assembling at this spot. Obviously, they are seafaring people in conjunction <coughs> with the caravan traders and who are looking together with the administration and maintenance of the Ur, the local town at this, at this port area. It is in the name of Sri, if we assume that actually this is called Sri Prithivi Ballava Pattanam, named after some uh, Eastern Chalukya rulers, it may have the forerunner of what happened between 1070 and 1090, the renaming of the famous port of Vishaka Pattanam after the name of the Chola ruler, Kulatunga Chola, as Kulatunga Chola Pattanam, we have to keep in mind Kulatunga was originally a Vengi ruler of the Eastern Chalukya house. He ascended the Chola throne only as by dint of his marrying into the Chola family. So there is this coastal pocket, a tendency to attach the name of the ruling house, the dominant ruling house in this delta come coastal region after the major political power. 
I would now like to take you to the Bengal region and particularly what we call the deltaic area, the lower part of the Bengal Delta, the West Bengal lower area, what is present the Tamaralipta area and slightly to the north of it, north of present the Kolkata, the, uh, the well-excavated uh, riverine place of Chandrakitagar. Chandrakitagar and Tamaralipta, these are two premier port towns in the western part of the delta. Chandrakitagar perhaps was not flourishing after 500, though Tamaralipta definitely continued up to 800 CE. And the best, Chandrakatugar is a very large, uh, very large uh, coastal, I, I should say riverine port and urban center noted for its profusion of uh, terracotta uh, artifacts, particularly like this. Chandrakatugar has yielded this kind of ship designs on terracotta ceilings, five such unique ship design bearing seals have been unearthed from Chandragitagar. But we are looking more at uh, Tamaralipta area. My hunch is this is an inscription, the Siddha Yatra type of inscription, where a Buddhist person, here a Mahanavika once again, Mahanavika Buddha Gupta, who hailed from Raktamrittaka area, a little bit farther north above in the Murshidabad district of West Bengal. And this inscription, he's a Mahanavika master mariner whose inscription was found actually in Malay Peninsula. Obviously, this person sailed down from Murshidabad area all along the Bhagirathi, possibly through Tamralipta area, and then sailed across the Bay of Bengal to Malay Peninsula. This is no accident for the port like Tamralipta, which was visited by Farshian for his pilgrimage farther to Sri Lanka, Mensch visited by Shuansang, who talks about its uh, maritime network, and definitely by Ijing. In late 7th century, all these three speak of the great port of Tamralipta, but also of its Buddhist cultural network and its contacts with maritime and mainland Southeast Asia. What is interesting is that Tamralipta was visited as late as 8th century. This is the last known information about the longevity of this great port of Tamralipta. Once again, it is a port town on the banks of the river Rupnara, not exactly on the coast, slightly inland. It was visited by three merchant brothers from as interior as Ajadhya in Uttar Pradesh. So it immediately shows the vast hinterland this maritime city commanded. <coughs> but what is captivating is the description of this place in Dandi's Dashakumara Charita of the 7th century where we find this is described as a Vela Kula, a port, and where Yavana Bohitras, the Sanskrit term Bohitra stands usually for ships capable of long distance oceanic voyages, distinct from Prabhana or Trapyaga, which are essentially coasters. A Yavana, we do not know who we mean by, who to understand by the term Yavana, but these, the Yavana ships, Vaitra, under the command of a Navika Nayaka, very closely similar to Mahanavikas, did visit. And there we uh, also came the pirates, threatened by the pirates. This is a typical coastal maritime world of a city having a long foreland and a very extensive hinterland visited by Bahitras. Also, to this flourishing city, the piratical activities are also attracted. 
the piratical activities were uh, prevented by uh, by the by the uh, Navika Nayaka, by the Mahanavika there. But more interesting, I'll come back to the Mahanavikas and the piracy slightly later. What is interesting is the description of games, relaxation, enjoyment at this maritime city. That's why I say it is not merely a trading center. It is a site where from, according to Buddhist legend, Ashoka sent his uh, daughter and son to Sri Lanka. The voyage started from Tamralipta, called Damalipta, in the Buddhist narratives. The Buddhist association is very prominent here. It is also the city of the tale for Dundi, describing how a young lady, beautiful lady, showing her skills in juggling with several balls, Kunduka, that's why she's called Kunduka Avati. And it's an entertainment, a public sport under the gaze of the people of the city that gives a window of the of the uh, city-ness of this port town very clearly oriented towards the Bay of Bengal area. The piratical activities, I would briefly say here, pirates are pretty active in both the coasts. The most famous case here in the East Coast is how Ganapati of the Kakatiya family issued a charter of security of Shashan in 1245 CE to give assurance to the voyaging merchants from the piracy and rampant looting of a ship that came adrift away from the destination ports, maybe driven by storm, and the pirates used to loot this kind of a ship driven to a port which was not its destination. And Ganapati stops this rampant piracy and gives assurance. And this is very common also. Piratical activities in the West Coast, Alberuni and Marco Polo give very graphic account of how the pirates from the Gujarat coast in their chain of ships, they were active right up to Socotra Island in the Gulf of Aden and thereby uh, active on the midships to, to uh, plunder the ships. They said there, there are indications of occasional violence and even the ruler of Tana or Thana, according to Marco Polo, connived with the piratical activities on the condition that the pirates will keep all others looted commodities, but the horses, the prized war machinery imported from overseas areas would be delivered, handed over to the ruler at Thana. So this is something also very common. But I'll come back now to the East Coast area, uh, the Bay of Bengal area. The, as I said, the, the port-like activities is best seen even in the eastern part of the Ganga Delta, what is called the active delta, the present in Bangladesh, the deltas of the Brahmaputra, Ganga, Padma, Brahmaputra, and then joined with Meghna, the massive Meghna River, and to the east of the Meghna stands what was called uh, what was called Samatata, now covering Noakhali Kumilla region of Bangladesh. Here stands a famous site of Deva Parvata, ancient name is Deva Parvata, now it is known as Mainamati in Kumilla area. This is a famous Buddhist site with well known contact, cultural contacts with Arakan. Also with mainland Southeast Asia, particularly the Dwarabati area of, uh, of uh, Thailand, southern Thailand area. And to the farther east and southeast stood the famous port of Samandar Sutkawa, that is present at Chittagong. It was Ibn Battuta in 14th century, early 14th century, came from uh, Mabar or Coromandel coast to this famous port of. Uh, 
Chittagong Sudkawa, and then voyaged along the Blue River or the mighty Meghna right up to Sillet in Bangladesh, but also speaks of a large island close to the port of Sudkawa. This is Sandeep Island. And he marked that myriad number of people from all parts of the Indian Ocean world flocked there. And with this comes the interesting possibility by Ibn Battuta noted a number of Muslim merchants from different parts of the Arabic speaking world in the 14th century. Now we know, thanks to the remarkable editing, decipherment, and translation of a newly discovered epigraphic record from Shuja Nagar, what is present day the Dhaka Bikrampur Faridpur area of Bangladesh? From there, the region from this Bongo sub region comes. This record of 1145, when it was being ruled by Bhojo Burma of the Burman dynasty of Bongo region, his Samanta Mahasamanta was a person called Abu Deva. The name Abu Deva is a Sanskritization of the Arabic name Abu. And the purport of the grant is Abu, who is a Muslim person and serving a local ruler of Deltaic Bengal, decided to grant cash in the form of cowrie shells. And please note that cowrie shells are not native to the Bengal coast, not to the Gangetic Delta. These are being brought as perennial currency of Bengal from the Maldives. So this itself is a story of maritime culture and maritime shipment of a marine product. This cowries were collected as shulka, as klipta, as stones and transferred to a shrine, a religious shrine in Sanskrit inscription called Allah. Uh, uh, th this is called a vihara meant for Allah Bhattaraka. This is nothing but a non-Brahmanical shrine. That's why called vihara with which the Buddhist shrines and uh, monasteries are indicated in favor of Allah Bhattaraka, Sanskritized form of Allah. The, and it also speaks of Paradeshikas, people from elsewhere, possibly Muslim merchants, who came at least six decades before the advent of the political face of Islam in 1205 in Bengal, in northern part of Bengal. There is nothing of the political conquest of the administration by Sultanate. This is recorded in a Brahmanical ruler's kingdom who is a devout Vaishnava in whose kingdoms numerous Buddhist manuscripts were copied, but also an Islamic shrine, possibly a masjid, a mosque was established by the active cooperation of the, an encouragement from a Brahmanical ruler, a devout Vaishnava, who is Vajabharman. This is an area where it is noted for excellent quality of silver currency in the Harikel Bengal, uh, coastal Bengal area. And with this, the combination of both uh, cowrie shells and silver currency are there in this coastal delta part of Bengal. I would now like to take you briefly to Gujarat, the other end of the opening of the west of the of the coast of North India on the west coast. And I'll take you to Somnath, which is called Someshara, Somanath Devanagara, Somnath as a Devakula in two inscriptions. 1264 and 1287, both are Sanskrit inscriptions. In fact, the 1287 inscription is the Arabic and Sanskrit inscription, bilingual. The very bilinguality speaks of his multiculturality. Far from the 
hackneyed image of Somnath as a great Shaiva sacred center being destroyed by the Ghaznavid inscription of one th invasion of 1025-26. It may have caused some damage to this great sacred center close to the sea. Somnath, the resilience of this area is writ large in this inscription, which speaks of Somnath as a vibrant center of Pashupata Shaiva sacred center, but also it is a port, a villa cooler, very categorically mentioned close to the sea on the Kathiawar coast. In fact, the first person to note the maritime orientation of the sacred center is Al Biruni. Who noted that along with being a major Shaiva sacred center, it is also a port offering passages to Zanz, that is East Africa coast close to Zanzibar. And in the 1264 inscription, we come across the record of a ship owner, Nakhuda Nuruddin Firuz, who came from Hormuz and used to come fairly regularly to this port where he was, according at his request, the local town council dominated by the Hindu people and local merchants, none of these are Muslim merchants, who allowed the purchase of a plot of land where a Mijigiti or mosque was raised and details are there in the Sanskrit inscription 1264. What is interesting is that there are Mahajanas, that is merchants, very likely so at the coastal town of Somnath, which is called a Pattana, a port, port town, and where also is, is propitiated along with Allah in the mosque and the Shoiva Pashupata temples, there is also the worship of Sikotori Mata. The name is derived from Sokotra. Sikotori, Sikotori Mata, a local divinity, a, mother, a goddess, who is propitiated by the sailors, by the ship owners, by the crew in the local area. So the combination of multiple faiths and the best indication, along with the Mijigiti, I'm not getting into the details of it. The Mijigit is located slightly away outside the city limits of Somnath, Somnatha Deva Nagarabad Chie, outside. But the properties donated for the upkeep of the, monk, uh, of, of the mosque are all located within the precincts of the city. So even if the mosque is located just at the outskirts of the city of Somnath, its interactions with the interior of the city, marked by mandis or mandapikas, marked by temples, marked by residential houses, marked by toranas or archways, are replete in the 1287 inscription, a Sanskrit inscription, a very influential Pashupata Purohita named Tripurantaka. He is very influential that the 1287 Sanskrit inscription, in fact, is a prashasti in his own name, which he caused to be written, composed by a mantri. So he has, this Brahmana priest has uh, contacts with the corridors of power. And there, the image of the city with daily markets, with the grains, also with non-local products like camphor, like pepper from Malabar, are being brought for the daily life, including religious rituals at the Shoiba temples. So this is where Somnath neither died down after 1025. In fact, it accommodates remarkable plurality. And the 1264 inscription in Sanskrit talks of the dhar of the Mijigiti of the mosque at the Dharmasthan, sacred center like the earliest mention of Makkah and Medina in the same inscription at Somnath Veraval at Masha Medina Dharmasthan. Since 
the 1264 inscription records the pious donation and arrangement of the land for the mosque and the construction of the mosque by this pious Muslim merchant from Hormuz. It naturally begins with a Sanskrit invocation, praising Allah in Sanskrit as Vishwar Rupa, universal, Vishwanath, Lord of the universe, and also as Shunya Rupa, formless and iconic. That is the clinching identifier. And Lakshya Lakshya, who is in who, who cannot be seen, who remains invisible, but who can be envisioned everywhere. And what is typically a feature of the maritime city? Somnath is not merely a sacred city, it's a port, but more than that, the remarkable plurality, the arrangement of the city, uh, the space of the city for port, for residential purpose, for the construction of a mosque, for several temples, for the bazaar area. All these are well marked out in the two inscriptions. And this is particularly seen in the dating system of the 1264 inscription. In four dating system, Al-Hizra, Bikrama Sambat, Balabi Sambat, Simba Sambat, all coming to the same date, 1264. The Hijri era is represented in the inscription, Sanskrit inscription, as the era Sambat of Rasulullah Muhammad, the Prophet, who is the preceptor Bodhaka of the maritime people, Naujana. Naujana, who are the Naujanas? Both as the Novittakas, the Nakhudas, like the Persian Nakhuda from Hormuz. And the no karmakaras, navika karmakaras, the sailors, the crew who are employed by the no vittaka, all of them are devotees of Rasulullah Muhammad. He is the bodhaka. Now, this is the emblem of coastal societies and maritime cities, the openness. The ability to absorb and but not mix up. It is not assimilation. If this is called plurality, diversity, but that does not mean everything has been done into a melting pot and given an Indicness or Indianness. The diversity is respected by the coastal people. And that is the message that cultural. Uh, diversity, plurality, accommodation and respect for plurality is the message the coastal society gives, both for those who come to the coastal society from somewhere outside and the local host society both play a stellar role in accommodating, in maintaining and promoting this cultural plurality and there lies the essential character of the subcontinental culture. There is no single strand of culture in the name of any dominant or majoritarian religious or cultural practice. India represents multicultural. I don't believe in this much vaunted and rather cliched use of unity and diversity in which only the unit is uh, stressed and diversity is thrown out. Had diversity been accommodated, we wouldn't have talked of Varna Sankara, the fear of admixture of Varnas through intermarriages among different Varnas. So that is to be thrown out. It is in fact the plurality and diversity which is the lifeline of Indic culture, not through any majoritarian cultural expression or religious strand. And that message is given to us by the coastal society, the openness of the maritime society. That's why I thought of sharing these thoughts far away from the landlocked river valleys with the teeming 
population of villages and agriculture is brought to the coastal world, the maritime world of the Indian Ocean, which the two seaboards of the subcontinent keep it at the very center of the Indian Ocean. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very uh, much, uh, Professor Chakravarti. Um, that was indeed a wonderful lecture. It was almost like traveling from West Coast to East Coast and then back to the West Coast. <laughs> And uh, you've, uh, you've really ended on a beautiful note on, on plurality, something which is so contemporary and we all need to understand and acknowledge uh, and still quite relevant. Uh, there were two or three questions, but I think we have sort of run out of time. So I'm going to take your kind permission and close the session today, but I will email you the questions and we Thank will you. share the answers with, with uh, speakers. Uh, and I can see Mr. Mukherjee has just shared his message yes. saying that it was an extremely enriching experience, which it was. Um, and so many beautiful references, uh, maps and photographs you showed. So I'm I'm quite certain this is not the last time you're speaking for us. <laughs> I'm sure oh. your little pitara has many, many more uh, stories from uh, from the oceans that uh, that we can hear. Thank you no, very I, much once again. I, and my uh, very and grateful thanks to all of you, particularly Professor Dr. Mukherjee and the entire excellent team, including yourself, Jayati. I see you after Thank some you. time. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, do Professor. Please, do please send the, the send me the uh, questions by email. I'll answer each would be. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.